people. And uh, I think what we will do, since we don't have a quorum, is we'll take uh, some of the simpler items first, uh, and we'll just take item number two first, and put that out of the way since we don't have an action uh, necessary on that. And that's with the hope that Mr. Uh, Rosendahl will be up here with us by the time we get to items one and two. Item number two is a Los Angeles Homeless uh, Services Authority uh, to report relative to the homeless count. Great. And um, if you could just give us the results and then let us know whether LASFL was successful in meeting its enumeration goals for this count, this year's count, and were all tracks enumerated and the adjustments you made. And uh, those are to start. Sure. My name is Leslie Wise. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning with the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. I'm happy to give you this update on HCO9 or the Greater Los Angeles Homeless Count. We don't yet have the results of the count, but we have successfully, successfully <coughs> completed or 95% completion of all four components of the count. And I can go through the methodology upgrades and, and processes we've um, implemented this, this time around. And so I have a brief presentation that I'll just walk through for you if that's okay. So. Uh, as you know, there were four components of the count, the unsheltered student <coughs> count, the shelter and institution count, the demographic survey, and a general population telephone survey. Um, accomplishments on each of these components, I'll start with the street count, um, and you've, you've heard some of this already, but this year we are quite successful in engaging a base of volunteers. To be more specific, over 3,000 volunteers made up primarily of, of citizens of the, of the Los Angeles city and county. Um, who came out um, and um, walked the census tracts assigned by our consultant and did a visual enumeration of folks that they saw on the streets the nights of January 27th through the 29th um, um, during the late hours of the, of the evening. Um, volunteers walked or drove over 13,000 miles of road. We counted 754 census tracts throughout the continuum of care and that resulted in a 50% increase over the number of census tracts we were able to count um, in 2007. So we're very excited that we'll get a more detailed account per census tract um, for the continuum of care. Um, so accomplish, uh, further accomplishments re regarding opt-in cities. This year we provided an opportunity for cities that fall within the continuum of care to engage in the same methodology that LASA uses um, for the continuum of care count. In all 15 cities um, and the community of Hollywood worked with LASA, used the same methodology, and completed a full count of census tracts within their jurisdictions. Um, the opt-in program is going to allow cities to more easily compare their own numbers against numbers per their spa or per their um, general area uh, to the continuum of care and to the county. Um, the data provided to cities through the opt-in program will help them better plan for homelessness in their particular jurisdictions and will also raise public awareness that homelessness is not just um, a problem uh, segregated to one or a few cities, but that it's a problem that we must face as a region and it, it, um, it, there is homelessness in all jurisdictions that fall within the continuum of care and within the county. Um, accomplishments, accomplishments relative to the general population telephone survey. Um, we've ex uh, significantly expanded our efforts to get a more statistically significant result out of the telephone survey. Um, this year we've called 4,000 um, um, households to try to gain an, an estimate of folks who are homeless that we cannot see by visually counting during the street night, the count during the, 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 street, the street count com component, okay. as well as folks that we're capturing in the shelter and institution count. Um, we also included a set of questions in the telephone survey this year to gain an understanding of public perce perception regarding homelessness, the causes of homelessness, their personal investment in trying to end homelessness over time, which I think will be an interesting addition to what we're learning from that general population survey. Some of what we're garnering through that uh, telephone survey will add to the numbers that we report to HUD. Um, in addition, we'll also gain an understanding this year relative to households that are doubled up, which we all know is a significant problem in Los Angeles, as well as households that have folks living within their home that are at imminent risk of, of technical homelessness as defined by HUD. So the telephone survey really gives us a deeper understanding of folks that are homeless but, but we can't see um, from the street count. Um, accomplishments, accomplishments relative to the shelter and institution count. We do this part of the count so that we can report to HUD folks who are homeless living in our emergency shelters, transitional housing programs, etc. A portion of what we collect through the shelter and institution count is required 
to report to HUD, and so we're on track with being able to report that information. But we go deeper and we go further in, the Los, in Los Angeles by trying to get a, an account of jails, hospitals, and institutions that also house homeless people on the nights of January 27th through the 29th who would technically be homeless, but HUD does not actually require us to report those numbers. We do it to get a better, again, to get a better understanding of homelessness in our communities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Recently, we've com uh, completed the demographic survey. Over 3,000 surveys were completed this year on the streets per census tract as determined by our consultants and in shelters where, um, that are operating within our continuum of care. Um, again, this is quite um, a significant effort and as you can imagine, in completing 3,000 surveys um, with people who are homeless throughout the continuum of care is, is quite an undertaking. So we had to engage a, different, a number of different strategies to make sure we were successful. We used volunteers, we used paid workers, we used outreach teams working within the continuum of care. Um, and we used in-house resources through our emergency response team and our um, HCFP team uh, within LASA. So completion timeline, everybody wants to know when we're gonna be able to report numbers and we know this is the most significant outcome that we work to, to provide our funders and to, to folks that care deeply about this. Um, and um, you, like I said, we're working with UNC, the survey research unit right now. My day-to-day -day work is to make sure that we're working towards a timeline. Um, they're crunching the numbers, doing the analysis of the data to make sure that we meet the HUD requirements for reporting associated with our application for our super, supernova funds um, that we anticipate will be um, due in early September. We've been told by HUD that that application will be due on or around Labor Day. Um, so we'll be coming out with um, um, some a phase one report for you and for other interested parties right around that time, Supernova application. Um, about a month after, we'll provide a more detailed analysis of that approach um, in a phase two report where that we'll provide to you, our funders, and to um, other interested parties. Uh, let's just go a quick question and just let the record reflect that Mr. Rosendahl has joined us. <laughs> um, in an anticipatory uh, analysis, uh, do you know, possibly know, the increase in homelessness that we can anticipate in our region given the economic factors and state budget realities uh, based on reports from providers that you may be getting? We are hearing significant concern that there's um, an increase of homeless due to economic downturn, mm -hmm. um, budget crises, et cetera. I don't have a good estimation for you as to how that's going to impact the count that we've done, we did on January 27th and 29th mm -hmm. through the 29th. Well, uh, why, why don't I do this? Let me give some thought to it and then uh, maybe put together some kind of a motion so we can start tracking those statistics come July the 1st. Uh, but let, me, let me think about how we, how we even ask the question because Sure. It's not going to be good. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is uh, an item that doesn't require any action, Mr. Rosendahl. Yeah. This was just a report. Um, so uh, I think that's all we have here. When, when will we get the numbers? Sure. Um, in a phased approach, the first set of numbers that we're going to provide to you, our funders, and other interested parties is on or around Labor Day. And I say on, Day. on or around Labor yeah, Day yeah. because that's when our application to HUD for McKinney um, homeless prevention dollars is due. And with that application to HUD, we have to provide um, at some point in time numbers from the 2009 count. Yeah. So we're going to provide a phase one report for you on or around that day, and then a more detailed report about a month after. Great. And when we heard whatever the report that came out, it showed less than the year before, and I think less than the year before that. Is that accurate? Or, or I mean, how do we know what we're doing on these things? Um, it, it's hard to know. Right now, I'd, I'm not able to anticipate whether the numbers go up or down or otherwise. Yeah. I do know that we, um, over the years, um, have more confidence in the methodologies and approaches we take towards getting an accurate assessment. Yeah, right. um, and so I'm going to be very excited to share with you how I, when we do get uh, an account from our consultants, how I think, how we think at LASA, how the executive leadership at LASA thinks um, methodology, approach, and working with the consultants that we've been working with may or may not have impacted a number. Santa Monica, for instance, said there was 900 and something was the figure I heard from them. Now, how would they know that when Santa Monica is in the heart of my district uh, and a homeless person isn't looking at a border sign, especially when you talk about the beach? The reason they, Santa Monica knows that is because Santa Monica participated in our opt-in program this year, which was quite exciting. And before you um, came in, I described a bit about how 15 cities 
that fall within the continuum of care participated in doing their own jurisdictional count, point in time like count. Like a Long formula. Beach did in the past? Long Beach has their own continuum, so yes, they do their own count. But Santa Monica does fall within our continuum of care. Uh -huh. um, we provided um, jurisdictions like Santa Monica the opportunity to opt into the count methodology that LASA uses for the continuum. And the city of Santa Monica counted every census tract that falls within their district. So on the same night that LASA did our continuum of care count, Santa Monica, in this, in this case, went out and counted every single census tract within the boundaries of Santa Monica and came up with a count. Um, that they're using for city planning for their own purposes in city planning um, to move forward with doing one a better estimate of homelessness within their boundaries and figure out what strategies they want to continue to implement or change to better address or reduce those numbers right does it make sense what they were doing there i think so because we helped inform the methodology so i hope yes i do hope that the the strategy that they use i'm just saying should venice have done that and maybe west you la you know I mean, that's what i'm asking exactly yes exactly this is um, although only 15 cities opted into the opt-in program this year, I'm confident that um, um, I'm confident that other cities will and should participate into the future. And the next count will be 2011. Do you think our city should should take that kind of a focus as a city? Well, within the city of LA, because the city of LA is a, a funder of the homeless count, we do do a statistic. We we do uh, pick a number of census tracts that fall within the boundaries of the city of Los Angeles, although it's not 100%, so that we can get a statistically significant estimate of the number of homelessness, homeless that fall within the boundaries of the city of LA. Mm -hmm. It's a big city. So when we look at it for the next census, please get with us, especially my district, where I want to get a better sense of what we're doing. Sure. Thanks. And the, the one point to make is that the um, Hollywood, although it's a neighborhood that falls within the city of LA, they yeah. did dis dis um, distinguish the boundaries that they wanted to count for Hollywood and other communities that fall within the city of LA could do the same thing and to determine one the boundaries that they want to count and then institute a full census tract within those uh, count within and my those last boundaries. Question then is when you did Venice did you count cars and campers we do count cars and campers yes are you able to break that out in Venice um, I'm not sure if we can break that out specifically about where we where we counted those cars and campers, but when we do the point in time count on the nights of January 27th, 27th through the 29th, we do count all ca cars, campers, RVs, and encampments. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, there's not going to be any action on this item, but uh, we do have two cards from, is it Shallis Shal McPherson? Yeah. Uh, and Didi Audet? Okay, come on up. Wow, we're, we're the only two that want to speak? Well, this is on item two. <laughs> item two, that you filled out a card on census item two. Count. Okay, on the census count. Um, I have I've a bunch item of, two. I have a lot of cards for item three, well, yeah. Did you put the wrong number down? Yeah, I did. I was I wanted three. All right. Let me <laughs> see if I think you <laughs> sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Actually what I, I came in here to support, you know. Yeah. Okay, and then what Bill. about and are you Dee Dee or I am Shelly. Dee Dee's back here. Dee, you meant item three? Yeah, he, she meant oh, item three item. also. No, one and three. We're here for both items. No, item two is <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All righty. All right. Smudge. All right, clear. Thank you. All right, let's go to item one. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Item then, one. Yeah, go ahead. Go, you go ahead. <laughs> item one is Los Angeles Housing Department and Los uh, Joint Report relative to the design and implementation of the Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program in the City of Los Angeles. Um, and before uh, the staff makes its report and I ask questions, and Mr. Rosendahl asks questions, I wanted to say how pleased I am that LASA. LAHD, Shelter Partnership, and the Chief Legislative Analyst's Office and Council staff have worked together to design this program. I think we've had a very good partnership in this effort, and I think that in making good policy, uh, working as a team is always the best approach, and one that is informed and takes into account all of the programs, all of the successes that we are having in actually housing people who are homeless in our city. And I think this program is going to complement those efforts and really go a long way to help us address the issue citywide. So who'd like to start? I'll start. Sally Richmond, Los Angeles Housing Department. Um, so the uh, 
federal government approved $1.5 billion for this new program, Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing, which we call HPRP for short. Um, the City of Los Angeles has been allocated $29.4 million, um, and that was allocated by formula, the CDBG and ESG formula. Um, so we submitted an application working with the partners you just mentioned. It provides financial assistance and services to prevent homelessness of very low income individuals and families or to help those who are currently homeless to become quickly rehoused and stabilized. And the priority of the legislation, this is part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, is to focus on not only those in most need, but those most likely to become stabilized, achieve stable housing with a short term, relatively small amount of assistance after this grant funding ends. Uh, the housing department is the lead agency for this. We're overseeing the whole program. We're going to be contracting with, uh, we're requesting to contract with LASA. Um, to implement all the programs, and the Housing Authority is playing a key role in the rapid rehousing program by administering the financial assistance part of the program. And as you mentioned, we have an ongoing working team that's, that will continue with a lot of work this summer because there's a lot of details to finalize here. And we've been doing a lot of research, consulting with homelessness researchers, working, meeting with local folks, experts, et cetera. And, um, and what's interesting about this program, it gives us an opportunity to innovate, to try new things in the city that um, don't really exist right now, such as outreach to folks living in vehicles, uh, and to create a new um, housing first program, which is the way the federal funds are going, uh, direction-wise, policy-wise. So we're going to be putting ourselves in good shape. So we expect to hear this coming Thursday, July 2nd, from HUD if they want any changes or modifications to or have any questions. Otherwise, we are, our application is assumed pro, uh, approved. In the meantime, we're working on de, you know, creating the, the program design, finalizing it, developing competitive processes to select proposals, developing a standard client assessment tool to be used by all the referral agencies. Um, and then once the RFPs are finished, the LASA will put them out on the street, applicants will apply, they'll receive them back, they'll review them, they'll decide, they'll make recommendations to the LASA commission and to the city council and the mayor. And then they'll have to draft the contracts and have everybody signed up by September 30th. So we have exactly three months from tomorrow to do all of this, which is a huge amount of work. So we're, we're working feverishly on this. We have a number of recommendations we would like your approval of that you authorize us to negotiate and execute the documents with HUD for the grant, mm -hmm. that you authorize the housing department to execute an agreement uh, with LASA subject to agreement by all parties and review of the city attorney to carry out the program. Um, that you authorize us to process future amendments using Executive Directive 3 or the grants um, uh, amend, admin code 14.8, if that makes sense. Um, authorize the Housing Department to establish these new programs and guidelines as we've described in the transmittal. Um, authorize LASA to release the transmittals, I mean to release the proposals, <laughs> request for proposals. Um, then authorize, uh, we are requesting the Housing Department um, approval of a resolution position authority. We would like to create one civil service exempt grant funded position a, um, for a project assistant for three years to help us get this work done. The reporting requirements are very onerous um, and very, um, demanding and also we request that that position be exempted not only from civil service but from the city's managed hiring process. We requested and were approved for a similar position for the neighborhood stabilization program but we did not request it be exempted from the hiring. Have to go through budget and finance on that issue. That's okay but we're still waiting because we haven't been exempted from the managed hiring process and so we have had the NSP program up and running since December and have not been able to yet fill that position. So that's why we're explicitly asking for exemption. I'll make sure that I'll assist you in getting that one before budget and finance. Great. Thank you. And I'm on that committee too. Okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> Thank I, you. I, would, I wouldn't want to even begin to take a position on that in this committee because you know, we sure. don't have yeah, the authority to do that. But right. We help you expedite you getting in over there. 
Thank you. And then we have a lot of controllers instructions I don't need to go through uh, to set up accounts and appropriate money for this. And then uh, we also want uh, the ability to make technical adjustments um, with the controller as long as they're you know, within the confines of what you've approved and to make any changes that are needed um, and submit those changes to HUD. So those are our specific recommendations. Okay. Thank you. Did you want to go next? I, I think I'm next, okay, if that's okay. Just a few minutes. I just want to provide a, a brief overview of the program design that we're proposing today and give you a, a, a process and timeline um, outline for LASA's RFP process. Um, so as you know, um, during the substantial amendment process, um, we proposed to you and you agreed that 54% of funds through HPRP be designated for uh, rapid rehousing and 36% of HPRP dollars be designated to prevent homelessness within the city of LA. Um, what I want to be clear about right now is the eligible households participating in HPRP within the city of LA. Um, what we're recommending today is that um, the city of LA um, propose, or I'm sorry, adopt the recommendation that um, all el eligible households per HPRP fall within the requirements outlined by HUD and that a client or a household have an income at or below 50% AMI and these are per the regulations of HUD for HPRP and have no immediate um, safety net thereafter. Going a little bit further though in our recommendations, um, and to be sure we're carefully, carefully using this finite resource, the recommendation is that we use at least 75% um, of the funds for beneficiaries or households at or below 30% AMI. Um, and this is because we want to ensure that um, we help those most affected by the economic crisis, people who uh, we're already subsisting in extreme poverty. Um, these are the people and households that are most likely to fall into the cycle of homelessness but for this assistance. And I also just want to take an opportunity to clarify some of the information that we presented you in, into the transmittal um, based on public comment offered at our June 26th commission meeting and informal comment from several of our partners, both community-based and technical assistance providers. We'd like to address the, the issue of eligible population specifically for the rapid rehousing program as submitted in the transmittal um, narrative um, that you've read. Um, I want to be very clear that um, per, per our recommendations, any ho homeless person, household, who meets the minimum eligibility requirements as outlined by HUD and can be reasonably expected to remain housed at the end of the short term assistance being provided by HUD is eligible to be served by this program. Um, we realized this was not clear in the transmittal, but LASA um, will work very hard to make sure that the eligible household households for HPRP is, is very clear in any RFP that we release hereafter with input from City Council. Um, so just very briefly, rapid rehousing, there's a couple components to that. What we're proposing is a regionalized approach to intake for all eligible households under HPRP for the rapid rehousing program and that we establish re regional coordinating agencies in two or three regions throughout the city of LA selected by a competitive RFP process administered by LASA. Um, and as a point of clarification from the transmittal, the regional coordinating agencies may accept referrals of all eligible clients from a variety of programs across the city. We realize that this was not clear in the transmittal, but we're um, committed to making sure that that's clear in any funding um, uh, RFP that goes out um, hereafter. So, just to clarify, that means all eligible households that meet those minimum requirements can be referred from emergency shelters, from the streets, all of those things, and again, that would be clarified in the RFP. But what this funding does for rapid rehousing, it, it gives us the opportunity to be innovative and to test programs that the city of LA has not yet been able to test and to set up systems for the services, for the delivery of services that position us to be most competitive for funding into the future. And that's why we've suggested um, um, a rapid rehousing program that's, um, that uses and implements the housing first philosophy and making sure that we are preventing people from entering a very ex expensive um, and non-efficient, no, not efficient system of care that is our emergency response system. So what we'd like to do is test whether or not we can prevent people from entering the shelter system. And by this in the transmittal, it's referred to as a, a diversion program, a shelter diversion program. So for some of the funds, we'd like to see if that's possible. Can we divert households from homelessness by use of these time limited resources? something we'd like to test, see if it works, see if it's a system we can create for the city of LA. If it and doesn't work, we can readjust. Generally, uh, what, do you, what do you estimate the release date uh, 
for this process will be? Um, you can give us a ballpark figure. Sure. Um, RFPs will be released um, around July 7th for the work plan we've established. Bids will be due back to Lhasa on August 3rd. Mm -hmm. There'll be a, a bidders conference in between the, that time, potentially okay. around July 14th. Okay. And we'll be back to you with recommendations for contracting um, on September 4th. Good. Okay. Um, who wants to go next? Got two. Okay. Ms. Schwartz. Okay. All right. Let's move it faster. Um, I'm supposed to talk about the interface with ARA and city programs. So. And let me suffice it to say, if you have some questions, I'll, I'll answer them. That, you know, there has been coordination already in conversations um, um, with the Family Service Centers, the Work Source Centers, um, on the CDBG program for higher income individuals, the, na the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, the Emergency Food and Shelter Local Program, the TANF Program, and LA Unified School Districts. And in almost all cases, there's been meetings with participants to see how we can and so it will and be coordinated. And I want to say the one that's already happened is the Emergency Food and Shelter Local Program, which is managed by a local board and has put aside $400,000 for first last month for first month's rental assistance while this program is being rolled out because it won't be really effective till the first of October but we'll still keep a pipeline of money available for at least first month's rental assistance and that's a substantial commitment by that board based on knowing what the city was doing so um, and you all had input into that process so through a motion so you know we're already seeing some fruits of that labor um, there was a question about you know making sure that the people that were impacted at risk of homelessness or who were homeless were really targeted that it's more f more likely to occur in certain parts of the city than other parts of the city but that all the city be included so i want to say that all the city is eligible and all the all the referrals can come from wherever but there was significant research done on neighborhood stabilization program on CalWORKs programs, um, dealing with evictions, dealing with where homeless people come. And, you know, a lot of that, what's happening with evictions and others have to do with the metropolitan part of the community where the poverty is the greatest. It's, you know, throughout the community, but, and especially in South Los Angeles. So those are the really most impacted areas. And I think we'll see referrals, you know, evident coming in the same direction. So um, I think I will leave it. There. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Carlos Van Natter, uh, Assistant Director of Special Programs at the Housing Authority. And there were a couple of questions that um, <coughs> you had previously, and one was, um, how is the Housing Authority going to be involved in the rapid rehousing piece with applicants in our various homeless programs, like our homeless program and our HUD Bash program? Um, we are going to provide referrals to HPRP for move-in cost assistance, first and last, and security deposits. Another question that was asked was whether or not the Housing Authority would be able to convert or roll over any of these HPRP clients to um, the regular Section 8 program. At this time, we can't make that commitment because we are at 100% utilization of the uh, Section 8 voucher program. Uh, we were planning on opening up for new registrants for the Section 8 program this year, but because we are at 100% lease up and we still have almost 15,000 people on the waiting list that will probably take place next year. Our attrition rate or people leaving the Section 8 program has also dropped dramatically too. It used to be we had three to 400 people leave the Section 8 program a month out of our 45,000 clients on the program, but now that number is down to about 120 a month. So those are the reasons why at this time we cannot commit to that. Um, beyond all of that, the Housing Authority will be involved in the rapid rehousing by um, inspecting the units that the clients locate through the assistance of the nonprofit agencies. We'll also be conducting uh, rent reasonableness determinations to make sure the rent is fair. We will also verify ownership with the landlords to make sure that we're paying the correct entity or person. And we will make the actual rental assistance payments. We'll cut the checks to the landlords and the other um, allowable agencies, such as utility companies and moving companies, uh, for these participants in the program. And we're going to use uh, a similar database to the one we use in the regular Section 8 voucher program. Okay. 
Okay, uh, one quick question. Um, I'm not sure who the best, Ruth, you might be the best to answer. Mm -hmm. If a family or a CalWORKs family or individuals received move-in assistance in the past, are they still eligible for move-in assistance under this new program? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing that precludes that. Right. Okay. Um, Actually, if you guys, if you have any questions. I, I do. Okay, uh, let let me, um, Mike, I know you had a meeting. Were you in the meeting, too, with my staff? Okay. Yeah, let him come up. Uh, no, I just met with your staff on Friday. Yeah, and in that meeting, they obviously pointed out uh, my concerns, uh, and uh, you heard them. Um, would you tell us what your thoughts are since that meeting on Friday, and share with the, 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 everybody what the meeting was about? Well. Well, I, I'm Mike Arnold, the executive director for LASA. Um, a, a concern that, that I think you've raised in the past, and frankly we share with you, is the issue of homelessness and vehicles uh, and RVs. Um, and one of, the issue, one of the questions that you'd asked at a previous meeting was whether or not some of this funding could be used to address that problem, particularly in, in uh, the Venice area, beach community areas. Uh, where there seems to be a particular problem with um, folks living in uh, uh, RVs and or other vehicles. Um, and in response to that, we actually have a, a program component of this where we're creating um, vehicular outreach teams yeah, yeah. that would specifically target um, identifying homeless families and individuals who are living in their vehicles or in RVs. Um, and, uh, and link them into either these benefited um, categories or into the general continuum of care. You know, one of the issues is, th is that um, this program is not designed for folks who are going to have long-term ongoing needs. But, but there is a domino effect in this in that we are able to um, create capacity in our existing emergency shelter system and transitional housing program by getting folks who are ready for permanent housing out of those um, locations using this money, creating capacity in those systems so that um, if we have folks who we find living in vehicles who need long-term assistance, they can be fit in the regular continuum because it, it should create capacity. If they are folks who need um, short-term financial assistance to regain housing, we can then rapidly rehouse them using this funding. Mm -hmm. So um, we are addressing the vehicular side. We are using this funding to the extent we can assist those who this program is designed for, and we believe it will also create capacity for those who may need longer-term, um, more sustained kinds of support in order to get housing and remain housed. Yeah, and I actually appreciate that, Mike, because I did bring it up several times in the Friday meetings. I said, oh, my God, a, a potential opportunity here to actually get some Obama money uh, into Venice for the cars and the campers. So when you mentioned the time frame of the 7th of July, you go out for bid and then da 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 da, uh, would that be the process? Or for instance, we don't have all these not-for-profit groups in Venice that could jump into this as quickly. We have St. Joseph Center, that I know is one. Then Santa Monica has a bunch, other places. How do we get it so that I can get a chunk of this directed at all those cars and campers. What What is your suggestion to us this day, the 29th of June? Well, first of all, the, the funding probably isn't going to be available until October 1st. Okay. So so our what our goal is, and when we're looking at the calendaring, it is being able to be deployed as rapidly as possible after the funding has been committed. So we're anticipating that on or around October 1st is uh, when the HUD grant will be signed and it will make available cash to fund these programs. Yeah. Um, and so what we want to be all queued up for is, is when that HUD grant gets executed, we're ready to roll. We've identified the contractors. The contractors have identified their programs, um, and we're able to implement immediately. So all of this is, is queued up to enable that to process to begin just as rapidly as possible. Now, is there a chance um, that we need to identify these potential providers now, see if they're willing in their scope of their minds to take on this issue? Because if I don't have a vendor, 
that's going to go through your process from July 7th through then, we're going to lose out on this. How do I get some comfort that I can get that happening? We should know um, the degree of interest from the um, agency community by about mid-July. There are a couple of um, proposer conferences that are already scheduled. Those proposer conferences are typically mandatory because we want to understand who's interested because we, as we've learned from the winter shelter program, knowing how many uh, folks are interested early on is really key to being able to implement and execute programs um, when the funding comes in. So we should know early on and then be able to take um, proactive steps at shoring up that if we don't have sufficient interest from the provider community. I, I would suspect, though, that, um, that there will be plenty of interest around this because I think every community is interested in, in helping folks in their communities. Uh, and the, and the, the primary um, reason that they've been unable to do so is a lack of available resources. And this program definitely brings resources to the table to address that problem. Mm -hmm. And give me the two scenarios that you just mentioned earlier that one could be eligible for this. And I'm just thinking of that person living in that car or that camper at this point. Obviously, the other homeless are there, too, for the obvious reasons of we need a lot of things to do. But this particular group, how would it work? Well, in this particular group, out, outreach is, as you, as you probably know, it, it's, it's going out and actively seeking out individuals who, who may be appropriate for a particular program. And, and these outreach teams will be specifically identifying folks who appear to be living in their cars or in um, recreational vehicles. Uh, and we'll be knocking on the doors, going through an interview and assessment process. Good. Now, the good news about this is that even though, even if we, they run into a family or individual who, who, who may require long-term service in order to get housed, once half of the battle is knowing what the needs are of that individual is. So while this outreach team that's connected to HPRP may not refer the individual in to get benefited under HPRP, they'll also be able to coordinate with the, the local outreach folks who are associated with either emergency shelters or transitional housing programs or other longer term service providers within the continuum so that we know this individual has these kinds of needs and here's how they would best fit into the system of care that we have to offer. So it has a lot of benefits just knowing what they need in terms of connecting them with the right resources that can help them. Thank you. Appreciate Great. it very much. Great. And if you folks would let these seats get freed up, because um, I'm going to call the cards. And when I get read, I'm going to call them in just a second, but just so that everybody knows, I'm going to ask for a report back in 60 days. And I also wanted to say that I think we're doing a far better job qualifying people who are chronically homeless in our shelters for housing that is coming online, and that includes units set aside for the Department of Mental Health clients, so we're being inclusive with the county. We have already opened the Abbey and the new James Woods apartments, and that we just saw them the other day, and they're beautiful. And we'll be leasing the new Carver and the Cobb apartments before the end of the year, and those projects are both subsidized with Section 8 and Shelter Plus Care, so the ongoing advocacy seems to be working and um, we are going to continue to build and have the lowest income li uh, clients living under 15 percent and below uh, with a long-term rental subsidy for success, stability, and for housing retention. Uh, shallow subsidy obviously is not the answer to long-term homelessness, but a substance subsidy that is adequate is. Um, and I want to applaud you for all that. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Bill. Good. Uh, but I do want to ask you later uh, more questions about the Santa Barbara and Eugene and how we could incorporate or look at them as models as well. What I like about today is this program has a larger scope and does not exclude clients. We have a program here that represents the city in its entirety. So this is a citywide effort using HUD guidelines at an income level of 50% and below. That's good for all council districts and council members, people who have homeless in their district, and I can't name you one who doesn't, um, and at-risk individuals. So I'm looking forward to this program working, and I think Bill is too. No big time. And I'm going to call people up four at a time, because we have a bigger item even after this, so we've got to get through both of these. All right, let's call up Becky Dennison, Anat Rubin, Monica Martinez, and Christine March. Or Marche. I can wave my sign. My comment for clarification. Thank you. Glad we clarified that comment. 
Oh, okay. All right. So that's fine. All right. So then let's see. Monica Martinez. Christine, is it Marge? March. March. Okay. And then Didi Audet and Chalice. <laughs> now it's your turn. Come on up here. And I'm the same. Monica from the Gap Performance Center. Okay. All right. Let me check Great. that off. Great. Okay. So okay. Didi hit it. And this great lady here. All right, now remember we're on item one, so, we're on item one. and then you've got your three coming up too, so I you're, just, you're good, you're good. Uh, as Wait a, a minute, that lady was first. Christine. Hi. That's Christine, right? <laughs> yes. Good. Okay. And then Dee Dee, and then Chalice. Shally. Shally? You're right. I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. You'll never forget now. No, I won't. <laughs> you're right. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christine Marge, and I'm speaking today on behalf of United Way of Greater Los Angeles. Uh, I have just a few brief comments. Uh, for the past two years, United Way has funded rapid rehousing and housing first programs across the county, and we prioritize these models because it's recognized as a national best practice uh, for homeless individuals and families to obtain and retain permanent housing. So we've already seen that these programs are placing individuals and families into housing more quickly with the assistance of short-term financial assistance and housing location. Uh, so we're very pleased to see rapid rehousing prioritized in ARA uh, because it provides LA an opportunity to deepen our investment in this model. Uh, so we've seen throughout this process, we've seen LASA and LAHD taking the lead on soliciting community input. We've appreciated that process. Uh, and what we heard from the community uh, in stakeholder meetings throughout the county was a few key elements that they wanted to see in rapid rehousing programs, including the targeted case management, housing location specialists, financial assistance uh, to assist with move-in and transition into housing. Uh, so we feel the exi existing program design effectively provides for each of these components. Uh, the one concern that we had was addressed by Leslie Wise earlier in, uh, in terms of the target population. Uh, so we just wanted to um, uh, express our support for the, for the program design as it, Great. As it Thank stands. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, as identification, I am pleased to serve as the Land Use and Planning Chair of the Thank Venice Neighborhood, Shally McPherson, the uh, Land Use and Planning Chair of the Venice Neighborhood Council. Um, as such, we uh, encounter a specific problem. The housing, the Department of Housing, is sweeping illegal units, which are usually affordable units, but they're like under the radar. Now, I approve of housing cleaning up illegal units and out of compliance use, but in this particular economy now, I would like you to use your influence with housing and say, yes, catalog the illegal units so we know that they're there, but put a timeliness on enforcing them to comply. And this is creative thinking here because housing doesn't like to doesn't like to postpone anything, and I can understand. But if okay. we could postpone five years, a uh, enforcement of bringing a unit into compliance, I have one uh, building in Venice that is was built with six units, and now has twelve. There's only six parking lots, I mean six parking spaces. This is a big problem, but there are five people living in very respectably cheap uh, rents and it keeps them off of the rolls of the homeless. That's, that's a plea from somebody that's, that's looking at it at least once a month. Thank you. Thank you. All right, say your name. My name is Dee Dee Odette. And I have to tell you that I kind of got into this part of it uh, because I was introduced through the RV dwelling thing. But there is a special place in my heart for boozers. There are probably any number of people in this room who can tell you that my favorite is Jim Beam. <laughs> so let's have that established. Okay. And I did go to Seattle where they are taking care of 75 chronic alcoholics. Now, this, nobody wants to live next to alcoholics, and we know that chronic alcoholics cannot, 90% of them, revert. So far, no one has come up with a program that's going to keep them off the sauce. And um, the reason I wrote this is to, on purpose to be shocking, because, believe me, 
it's much better to die in an institution or in public housing than in filth on the street. And that's what's happening. And we have to do something. So please, please help. And um, in regard to some of the other things that I've been hearing people to say here, um, it isn't just Seattle that's um, doing this. Also in Milwaukee and Minneapolis, there are programs. Now, um, if it would help, I'll go anywhere and take photographs, write reports, do whatever is necessary to solve the problem, because I think that's the issue. How do we solve the problem? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, let's, uh, let's see. We got Peggy Lee Kennedy, Steve, is it Steve Clare? Steve Clare, Booker Pearson, and Barbara Siegel. Come on up. Peggy Lee Kennedy. Peggy Lee Kennedy, and I, uh, I'm with the Venice Justice Committee and Media Group. Also, I am the coordinator for the Peace and Justice Ministries for the Venice United Methodist Church, and we also feed people regularly on the street and living in RVs. The first thing I want to say is that I'm a little concerned about the 30% below medium income, uh, focusing uh, so much on specifically that percentage because I'm uh, concerned that people on SSDI might be excluded. And we're talking very, that's a low amount, $1,500. So brings you above that 30%. And it, it's shocking, but true. So that's the first thing I'm a little concerned about. And second, I want to say is as in Santa Barbara, I would like to see any RV targeted program administered to be somebody special with this in their heart that is connected to the population somehow. Uh, we have some social services in our area, and uh, really the, the connection between the population and those social services has been bumbled, in my opinion, severely bumbled. Uh, you know, some Section 8 vouchers come in, and I contact them about uh, a specific person who's disabled and has some kids. And this person has a case manager at that social service, and they send the outreach going up and down the streets describing this person to everybody in town, blowing their cover because they're living on the street. It's illegal. And the person texts me and says, please call them, tell them to stop. And they have a case manager at the social services. So, I mean, the closer we can get to the population, the better the success. And the higher the bureaucracy, I noticed, um, the less success. Thank you. Uh, Steve Clare. Hi, my name is Steve Clare. I'm a director of the Venice Community Housing Corporation. I'm just a few general comments. I'm really pleased that this program, that you're undertaking this program. I think it's a lot easier to prevent homelessness than to get them out of homelessness. So I, I have a lot more optimism about the preventing homelessness portion of the program than the rapid rehousing portion. Uh, at Venice Community Housing Corporation, we have 175 units of housing, all of which is affordable to people of very low income. Right now, we have uh, over $40,000 in rent receivables and uh, 42 people out of 175 that are behind in their rent. 34 of those people are behind in their rent because they have uh, lost their job or they've had their, or their hours cut back. And we're working with those people to try to figure out ways to keep them in their housing. And of course, this program would be uh, you know, really urgently needed for them uh, while they're trying to get themselves reestablished, find other work or additional um, uh, income from uh, uh, some other uh, job. So, uh, so that, that's, that's very good. I, I think you've got it flip though, I mean, I think you only have 40% of the, of the money going there and 60% going to, uh, to rehousing. And when you look at the sources, where are people going to be rehoused in the, in the uh, housing crisis that we are uh, existing in today? The gentleman from the Housing Authority says there's no Section 8 vouchers. They're, you're basically trying to get people into unsubsidized housing. And when you've got a program that's pegged to 
<laughs> which I totally support, the idea of pegging the program to 50 percent of the median, 75 percent of that, to people with 30 percent of the median, you know, I wonder how realistic it is to, to set as a goal for yourself to you're going to house, rehouse 80 percent of the people in your program within four months. I mean, I thought was the, that was the goal for the housing department. I think that's way over ambitious. I think we need to take a real a realistic look about what uh, what's, uh, the program can actually do and make sure that, that we're going to be uh, cre fashioning something that can actually be accomplished. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Chair, before you leave, if I could, um, Mike, would you address that when you come back up because this is a compelling issue for us to, to look at eligibility issues uh, and if there's flexibility in the Recovery Act money, I think the flexibility is clearly being stated, at least by these two speakers, uh, that that are worth reviewing. Mr. Pearson and then Ms. Siegel, and if you guys could let those two seats uh, open up. So David Ewing can come up, and that will conclude our public speakers. My name is Booker Pearson. I'm the uh, board chair of Upper Bound House, and the, uh, I'm also chair of the Westchester Playa Neighborhood Council Committee on Homelessness and Vehicular Living. Uh, I also applaud... Uh, Losses uh, program and the efforts to rapidly rehouse and to prevent homelessness. I would say, though, that uh, we need to be careful about the demographics, and the, I would like to see some emphasis placed for homeless families with children, which is what we deal with. Uh, Council Member Rosendahl mentioned the Santa Monica homeless count. There's also a homeless count in Culver City every, every month. None of those counts show one single, not zero, not one homeless child, not one homeless family. However, we know by anecdotal evidence that uh, the, the director of the Culver City Housing Authority said she gets two families per day, every business day, knocking on her door who are going to lose their uh, premises or have already lost that. Uh, in Santa Monica, who show no homeless families, no homeless children, the director of one of the premier uh, social service organizations that does after school activities for children and I cannot name it because he's in trouble if I told you but he gets 10 to 20 families of young women with children who knock on his door and say can we please sleep in your parking lot in our car because we have no homes mm -hmm. and this is in a city that has no homeless so I would implore Lassa when I, I think your telephone survey is good I think that you know, those kinds of different types of looking you will not find homeless families with children when you go knocking on doors. I would like to see, if possible, a set aside for homeless families with children in your rapid rehousing program because right now all I heard was a means test. And uh, homeless children is an exploding uh, population. We know that not um, addressing them is going to cost us far more than we can ever afford at this point in our time if we let these kids live out their lives on the street and become antisocial adults. Thank you very much. Thank you for your input. Uh, Steve? Is it David. David and then Barbara. Right. Uh, you were or was it Barbara? Yeah. Barbara okay. then, okay, okay, Barbara next. Okay. <laughs> Barbara Siegel, Neighborhood Legal Services. Uh, I'm here to definitely support this proposal. Uh, for many years, our office has run self-help centers where we try to help people with unlawful detainers when they're uh, being thrown out of their home and the biggest problem is they have absolutely no negotiation capacity and this allows us to truly negotiate on behalf of these clients and we definitely applaud this effort. I would definitely caution that we do something to coordinate between the cities and the counties efforts so there's not a duplication of effort which would require getting some pretty good coordination and communication with DPSS which is where the county is placing its funding. Um, I do appreciate the clarification today that LA Housing Authority is going to handle the financial end of this. I was a little concerned as to who would be able to ramp up quickly enough to do that kind of money movement around in a very rapid manner. Um, I would like to comment on two issues that arose here. One is housing of children. I know in the San Fernando Valley we had the same problem with families with children not having a place to go when they are homeless. There are no shelters that have open spaces for them. They show up at Union Rescue Mission. They're sent to LA Family Housing and they can't find anything and they call us. Right. There's really nowhere to place these individuals. So Maybe you can help us lobby over the next year because this is something I've been saying since 2001 um, uh. about the lack of um, you know, homeless um, um, places to live and services 
uh, for families in the San Fernando Valley because Skid Row is not a good place for children. It's a dangerous place. It is not. Um, nor is necessarily a shelter. I think we really have to yeah. advocate for affordable housing for well, these maybe individuals. Maybe you can help us on that too, because we might be happy to. Real slow <laughs> on certain parts of the city on that. I'd be happy to. And uh, the last issue on uh, the individual. Really? individual that commented on individuals on SSDI. It was my understanding from this proposal that people with disabilities do get some priority and if they're on Social Security disability, they by definition have a disability and therefore it was my understanding that the people, even though they might be slightly above the 30 percent, would qualify for assistance under this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Ewing. Hi. David Ewing. Uh, I'm a resident of Venice and a uh, member of the Venice Community Coalition. Okay. I just wanted to follow up on. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something that that Shally uh, brought up, um, and I think you know we've got this tremendous irony that we're we have a housing bubble. We produce too much housing, and yet we've got an explosion of homelessness. And in Venice, I know we do have. Uh, a great number of bootleg sort of granny flats, as, as we say. Um, and this may be a pipe dream, but uh, I was wondering if there's some way, and this may be a little off topic too, but I was wondering if there's some way that you could create an amnesty where people could report their bootleg units and be legalized with the, um, with the requirement that when the current tenant leaves, that apartment become an affordable unit. Um, it would seem to me that you've got a supply of illegal housing and you've got a, a, a great population of people in need of housing and why can't those be matched up somehow? That's all. Thanks. I, I might want to respond, uh, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. you want to speak first? If or? you want. No, um, that's fine. Just to let you know yep. that when the new council reconstitutes itself and we get past this uh, summer recess, I intend to put in a motion uh, with at least one other colleague, we've talked about it, of dealing with the 75,000 granny units in the city. And what I would like to do, if the council will, will go in that direction, is to grandparent them in with electric and plumbing issues resolved yeah. so that whoever's paying rent, uh, they're getting a safe place and a healthy place, number one. Uh, number two, um, the um, landlord has an honest relationship with the tenant, mm -hmm. uh, and the tenant has tenant's rights within that context. And then, of course, the revenue streams uh, for anybody who rent does rentals would also come in. It's been a big issue and a controversy before I came on the council. Uh, and I do know that uh, there's energy to discuss this issue in a more open and transparent way. And I intend to uh, uh, co-present uh, a motion on that uh, in the fall. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so with that, Mr. Rosendahl, we're going to get a report back in 60 days from the start of the program about the progress made, number of individuals and families that we were able to help through this program, uh, status report relative to implementation, but not limited to any changes, to client eligibility criteria within six months of service or contract execution. Included in that will be the establishment of a formal referral system between HPRP contractors and city work source centers in the appropriate HPRP RFPs and instructing the chief legislative analyst with the cooperation of the chief administrative officer, LAHD, LASA, and HACLA to identify a contract administrator for the contract with HACLA for the HPRP uh, Rapid Rehousing Rental Assistance Program and report at that time the service contracts are awarded. So that'll be the uh, order on that. And, yeah. and I like that, and, and it's great, it's comprehensive. But to respond to some of what you heard here, mm -hmm. I would like that response within it too, which yeah. for instance has to do with eligibility uh, and the flexibility of eligibility. And I think we need to be flexible in our eligibility. I think the issue of families, children, uh, has to have a direct relationship to it. 
I do like uh, the fact that uh, Steve Clare mentioned some of his tenants can't make their payments. This program will work right into that need, which will be a, a tremendous plus. A and anything to do with this SSDT uh, uh, in terms of one's disability should also come into this. The goal, frankly, is for us to, to remove people from the street or from the car and the camper where they're willing to be removed. But I also would like a report back and the city's opinion, the county's opinion, the losses committee, and this recovery money of strategies, and this will lead into item number three, of what's happened in Santa Barbara and Eugene and other places across the country that have addressed uh, uh, this issue and have models that maybe we can implement right here in Los Angeles. Okay, thank you. That concludes item one, and now we're going to go to item... Oh, excuse me, Council Member. Just for the record, do you wish to, um, in addition to the amendments that you stated, do you wish to approve the, the recommendations included in the LASA LAHD uh, joint report? So moved. Yeah. Yes. All right. Now that concludes one. We're going to go to three. Now, um, I want to make sure that everybody has the same amount of time. Uh, so I'm going to hand the cards to Mr. Rosendahl in a minute. And just say for the record, in the event that uh, if I'm not here at 5 o'clock to be able to vote, I would have voted to approve this motion and want to go ahead and move this to Mr. Rosendahl's Transportation Committee so we can get that party started over there. Um, and uh, with that, City Attorney, who's the set? There he is. I know I saw him. Again. Mr. Pritzker. And Mr. Rosendahl will be calling public speakers up, but. I wanted to say that for the record because with two minutes each, each and we have nine speakers, that'll be at least 18 to 20 minutes. And I, I just might not be here when it's time to vote, so it'll move forward out of committee without recommendation and go on over to Transportation Committee. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Councilman Rosenthal. <coughs> Keith Pritzker, Deputy City Attorney. Uh, and I'd also like to um, make a point that I'm addressing my comments to those uh, who are in the audience, especially those who have submitted cards, because I think some of the comments that I'm going to be making uh, in a couple minutes may uh, address many of the things that uh, members of the audience uh, might be intending to bring up. Um, I was not aware of, um, of this item until um, it was brought to my attention this morning. However, um, I did um, a bit of research, and I wanted to share that with you and with the audience. Um, I understand that this motion uh, that Councilman Rosenthal introduced on uh, item number three was introduced uh, last November. So it's, it's been sitting around for over seven months. And um, I, was, um, I, I noticed that it seems that staff has not, to my knowledge, had a meeting uh, to talk about how to go forward uh, with either uh, implementing the recommendations of the motion or explaining back to City Council why those recommendations or wh why the uh, motion can't be done. Uh, so um, it, it is clear to me also that we're going to need uh, an interdepartmental uh, meeting of, um, of staff. Uh, we need not only um, my office uh, and the CLA, which is mentioned uh, in the motion, uh, but of course, uh, DOT, Public Works, and within Public Works, Sanitation, Street Services, and then uh, the housing uh, people in the city. Uh, and and um, we have a neighborhood prosecutor in the audience here. Uh, we've probably got uh, half a dozen different lawyers that, that will all need to provide some input in discussing uh, this proposal. Uh, there are issues that involve property rights, and I expect that to the extent that we can, uh, you know, might be able to use some model from Eugene or Santa Barbara, uh, we're going to have to take account of property rights. Uh, in terms of city streets, uh, there is some limitation provided in the vehicle code under vehicle code section uh, 21 that prohibits our ability to regulate how we use the city streets unless there is authority that is specifically granted uh, under the vehicle code. Uh, however, it doesn't mean we can't use our private city parking lots uh, to perhaps provide uh, locations where people who have no alternative but to live in vehicles uh, might be able to do so. Uh, so those things need to be 
uh, I think, discussed uh, in detail by city staff. And once city staff has sorted through these issues and has at least a few options, uh, we then should bring the stakeholders into the discussion uh, and see if we can develop a consensus. Uh, so um, I'm, uh, I apologize for the fact that uh, it seems that nobody else in, in my office has um, gone forward with this since the motion was introduced. Uh, but I can promise you that uh, if we do continue this for 30 or 45 days or 60 days, uh, that I will uh, see to it that, uh, that I track this motion for my office um, and, and will work cooperatively with the other city departments uh, toward the end that I mentioned. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move it out of this committee today anyway. So okay. by the time it goes ahead and hits his transportation committee, that will probably give you the time you need anyway. Good. Yeah, and in responding to, to what the chair has said here, uh, when it's reported out of here, it will go to transportation. Uh, I want that collection of yeah. all of the various departments, but I would like uh, in transportation a report uh, in 30 days that would tell us where you're at in that process uh, and who's involved, what kind of strategy you're doing so that we can refine that maybe uh, before you come in with a, uh, a final report, before we agendize it for a whole discussion. But I want to agendize it in transportation for at least the first of a series of, I would think, reports that you would put together that we could put in front of ourselves. Okay, well, with that understanding, um, I will attempt to put together an interdepartmental meeting sometime um, in the next couple weeks so that at least we could report back informally in your transportation committee in 30 days uh, as to where we are with those discussions. Yeah, or for sure before we go on recess. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, do you want to you give a yeah. start calling the cards? Yeah. Just for the public's information, and we do have a bunch of cards here, Ms. Perry's going to be leaving, but you heard of our discussion interaction here, um, and I will be in the transportation committee after July 1st. And maybe in a leadership role, but we'll wait until we see what happens with the change of the guard here. Uh, item number three, D.D. Odette, Chalice McPherson, Linda Lux, and Chris, uh, I can't say it, Chris, last name? Lord. 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 Come on up, Chris. It's just the P.L. gets me, I don't want to say an F almost. Right? I heard that. Let me throw him over? Yeah, I mean, just scratch your mouth. Here, please. No, I think yeah, no, I think it's great. Or my first? Uh, Go for it. Okay. First of all, I want to say that the woman sitting to my left, Miss Didi Audet, is the one that, after she was uh, ceased being the president of the Venice Neighborhood Council, on her own initiative, went to Santa Barbara and did the report. She went to Eugene, Oregon. And she did the report, the reports that you have in front of you and the reports that have been circulated. I um, am here to absolutely support Mr. Rosendahl, Council Member Rosendahl's motion of November 18th. And I am also rather upset that it's been seven frigging months since anything has been done about it. And I'm not going to say anything else about that because we all know how I feel about that. Um, We're looking forward to our new city attorney. <laughs> oh, are we ever? Yes. Um, that's about, that's it, that's it. Yeah, oh, but I forgot to ID, didn't I? Shally McPherson, uh, Chair of the Land Use and Planning Committee of the Venice Neighborhood Council. That's for ID only. I'm not representing the Venice Neighborhood Council. <laughs> but for myself, thank you. Dee Dee Odette. Hi, my name is Dee Dee Odette. I'm from Venice. Uh, I've presented to you with this yeah. packet of papers here. It contains, um, uh, copies of the Santa Barbara and uh, Eugene reports without the photographs that I put in them originally. But look, show this to the county. Down. These vehicles <laughs> are fragile. And the holding tanks are almost always on the left hand side. If there is a side swipe we have an occasion for hazmat. Yep. And I think that that would be a nice thing to show the county and say, come on now, we need some money. Because this is a sanitary issue. There is no 
getting around it. Underneath that a large picture, there are pictures of. I saw it. <laughs> you saw it. Okay, we don't need to go into it. It was nasty. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Uh, but look, there are ways to deal with it. There are trucks that will go around mm -hmm. and drain those tanks. I mean, there are num there we this is not as intractable a problem, I think, as just homelessness. Mm -hmm. I think we can do something about this. And here's just a little fun cartoon. And I, I believe it's meant to represent uh, Moses today on the mountaintop. And he's got a, um, uh, a stone thing that he's uh, incised. A a oh, thank you, preacher. Uh, a stone tablet. It says 10 comments. One, don't worry, be happy. Two, have a nice day. And his comment as he looks upward is, thanks a bunch. I'll just run these by our committee and pass them along. <laughs> okay. 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 Oh, thank, thank you. you. He's a living legend. I know. <laughs> Can I ask Carol Rios to come on up uh, and Steve Clare? Uh, to those two empty seats. Um, you're up. Good afternoon. Linda Lux. Council members. Uh, Linda Lux. I'm the vice president of the Venice Neighborhood Council for purposes of identification only. And I'm glad that you're passing this out of committee. That's what I came here to urge you to do. Um, people living in vehicles is not going to get better anytime soon. In fact, 380,000 people who are currently on CalWORKs are getting cut in LA County alone. So those people, if they're lucky enough to have a vehicle, are probably going to move into the vehicle because they sure won't be able to afford to stay in their apartments. So the problem is going to get worse before it gets any, any better anytime soon. So this, your motion, council member, is wonderful. I think LA has an opportunity to, to be a leader in the, in the country, as, again, by take, be proactively finding safe parking places for people who are living in vehicles. It's better than living on the street. It's not as good as living in an apartment, but it's a reality and it's a citywide reality. So that it has to be addressed on a citywide level. And as other people have said today, there are, in every council district, there are people living in their vehicles. And to deny that would be ridiculous. It's happening. So be able to identify them with outreach and attaching them to social service agencies and case management gets, is the first step in finding ultimately housing. I know the city is currently building 800 units. That does not even a drop in the bucket. So the chances of actually finding housing are slim to none for most of those people, many of whom I hear today are families with children. So keeping them safely in cars or RVs or whatever they're in, in a safe parking place just for parking overnight, not for encampments. I know just from in Venice there are a couple of social service agencies that would be willing to take a few cars. There are churches that would take a few cars. If people adopted two or three or one or four all over the city, that would take, it wouldn't solve the problem, but it would certainly take care of a whole lot more folks now that are being taken care of. And it would remove the fear that residents, at least in my community, and I'm sure others, have the, the unhappiness they have with people living in cars in front of their houses. Nobody wants that. But not having a safe place is, is, is really scary for a lot of people. So thank you. I appreciate, appreciate your motion. That. Thank you. Chris? Hi, my name is Chris Plord. Um, uh, I want to say 800 units is better than what we had before, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I don't, don't want to belittle that. Um, for me, I just wanted to, to, to put a principle on the table, which is the principle is you should not criminalize rational behavior, you should govern it. And what we were faced with, and unfortunately it's in your hands now, is a failure of government for many years to actually govern the problem of homelessness. Instead, it was criminalized, and Bill, you know, that it was criminalized by making it illegal to sleep in vehicles overnight. It was criminalized by making it illegal to sleep in parks overnight. These are rational behaviors. If you've lost your home, it's rational to seek to sleep in your vehicle rather than behind the dumpster at the Ralphs, which is equally illegal. So, so as we move forward with this proposal of yours, which I love, it's because it's an attempt to govern the, pro the problem instead of to uh, uh, criminalize the rational behavior. Um, um, knowing as we do now, that there's 100% utilization of, of Section 8 housing, that there's 15,000 people on the waiting list. We know this problem will get bigger as, as time goes on, at least in the next year or two years. And, um, and so I, I really do, I, I thank you, uh, uh, Councilperson Perry uh, and, and Bill, for passing this out and for uh, making this move along. Thank you. 
Um, my name's Carol. My name's Carolyn Rios. Um, I'm a board member of the Venice Neighborhood Council, and as a board member, I'm the co-chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness. I also run the Oakwood Barbecue. I'm not that these are all for identification purposes. However, in this capacity, you guys are politicians. I go all over Venice. I go to events. I go to meetings. I talk to people. I take I take this position seriously. I want to tell you the people in Venice want a solution to the RV. They want a medium. They want they want safe places for them. Um, in this capacity, last week I was at the Oakwood Advisory Park. Um, what does that mean that we're politicians? What does that mean? I'm just saying that I go around talking to does people and I listen. I listen what? to them. I listen okay, to them. Mean, what, what? I meant that as, I didn't mean that in any negative fashion. Oh, okay. You're taking my time. I'm, I'm sitting here confused like, and, <laughs> She's one too. Okay, go ahead. I take it seriously. I listen to people. Yeah. I talk to them about issues. Um, at the Oakwood Park Advisory Board last, last week, there was a, a meeting, and they were talking about daytime restrictions because on the side of Oakwood, there are currently anywhere from 8 to 12 RVs parked. Um, everyone in that room that night was A, against any kind of restrictive parking in Venice, daytime or nighttime. Now the issue was not nighttime parking, but I wanna tell you that everyone in that audience made a point of saying, we don't mind the RVs parking on 7th. They're not bothering anyone. There's a park on one side, there's a church, a parking lot, and a nursery school on the other side. At night, no one's there, and so, what I want to tell you is that people made a point of saying, we, we don't mind them there at all. It's a good place. We're glad they're there. And so and the other thing, because I, I lost about 45 seconds with that, is I want to tell you that I have looked into the Eugene program. I think it's a very good program, but we are in Los Angeles, and we want to look at that program with a lot more flexibility. I like the word that um, Dee, Dee came up with, creative. I mean, having a truck come around creatively, you know, looking at that as a general guideline, but it does seem to be a very good program. I've talked to people in Eugene who are happy with it. So that's maybe a starting point to go from there, but uh, we can't have some of the rest. They, they have lots of space there. We don't have that kind of space in Venice. We need to accommodate them without uh, some of the restrictions. Steve, thank you. Uh, Steve Clare, a Venice resident. Uh, I just want to generally support this uh, this motion and uh, applaud you for bringing it forward, um, Councilman. Uh, I think it's well designed to allow flexibility because I think communities do feel differently about homeless people and have a higher or lower tolerance for trying to accommodate um, homeless residents as part of the community. And I think where that where the appetite and the will exists to try to uh, create model programs and to see how they work and to see if uh, if they can be instituted more broadly. Uh, I think that's a good thing. So the the motion that you're making uh, gives council people discretion to not only do it within their council district but also in particular parts of their council district. And I think that uh, that's a good thing that will allow everybody to breathe a little sigh of relief that that, not, that no one is going to get uh, something imposed on them. But at the same time, those communities are, are willing to uh, to address this uh, issue in a positive way. We'll have the opportunity to craft good solutions. So I applaud you for it. And I look forward to maybe getting the city attorney to finally, after seven months, take a look at the motion and try to give us some good feedback. Thank Appreciate you. that very much. Peggy Lee Kennedy, uh, David Ewing, and Booker Pearson. Peggy Lee Kennedy. Uh, thanks for listening to all the public comments, uh, count, dear council people. Uh, the only thing I want to say about this as it travels forward is I really hope that the city can see its way into working with s some of the people that have already been organizing around this issue and are very close to it. Because I don't see how there could be a real solution that'll work with this population. It, you know, there's a lot of reasons people live in vehicles. So I think that there's a few people in our community that have been 
spearheading efforts for years working on this issue. And it would really be nice if the city, instead of uh, working with a neighborhood council committee that was created by people who want to put permit parking in in order to remove the RV people. As an alternative to that, working with community leaders that have been working together on their own to, to solve this problem and coming up with ideas on their own and, you know, really trying to lobby. I just hope that, and also uh, the other agencies that are funded, like LASA, because I have to tell you, we have a community leader in here, Steve Clare, that's been uh, an amazing uh, leader lately uh, in this effort. <laughs> well, in the homeless, no, in the RV effort. Okay, before Miss, are you finished? The only reason I'm saying that, I want to get a vote of two of us okay. out of this committee. She has to leave at five. You know what, you can take the vote. No, go ahead and vote. And it's better that? to have a vote. Well, I ask, think it's better to have clerk, a vote. Clerk or city can attorney? Can I vote and then he can still let them talk? Or no? It needs to be, you need to be present when you, when you guys actually take official action on the... So right, if they, they wanted can, to they talk can, afterwards. If, if we if we oh, defer, yeah, if, you, if, yeah, if yeah. we yeah. defer yeah. our public sure. comment until afterwards, vote. Uh, it was fine with it's me. Better uh, vote. Uh, and then, uh, it's then, better okay. if you vote. So you probably have to get permission from people to defer their comments, right? Would you no. defer for a second and let us no, take no, the vote? No, no, no. Okay, no, okay fine. Let us, let us uh, take I, the vote. I make a motion that we approve this out of committee and send it to transportation committee. Fine, without objection. Okay, it's done. So done. <laughs> she didn't get too much sun yesterday. <laughs> but I just wanted to finish by saying that last year, uh, or whenever it was, there was a Venice Neighborhood Council on homelessness. And after that, after that town hall meeting, a task force was created. And Steve Clare headed that task force. And uh, it was dissolved. I think inappropriately by the neighborhood council. And I just want to finish by saying that I think Steve Clare is an incredible leader on the RV topic right now, not just on housing. He's been doing that for years. And I would hope that LASA and the city council would recognize this and work with him. Sounds very good to me. Okay, please. Preacher. Hello. My name is David Ewing. And just by way of identification, I'm the co-chair of the CD11 Transportation Advisory Committee, member of the Venice Community Coalition, and uh, runner-up for the Extemporaneous Public Speaking Award in my eighth grade class. <laughs> it's all been downhill since then. Um, yeah. Um, I'm hoping that... Bill, I'm hoping that you can get these departments in their interdepartmental meeting to try and identify the extent of flexibility that you can get. In other words, to give you the widest range of tools so that when you craft whatever you craft here, you won't be limited to a, you won't be straitjacketed. If something doesn't work, you'll be able to try something else without going through the whole process all over again. And particularly, I think, in terms of um, street use. Uh, because the gentleman from the city attorney's office identified that as a potential problem, that the vehicle code limits uh, the, use, the street uses. So I think that's important to explore. Um, the residents do have real and serious concerns. Those should all be taken into account. And, um, and the idea that this is a voluntary program for the various council districts, that it be flexible enough to be used in one district, uh, uh, in, in, in particular parts of a district without uh, being uniform. But also, we should keep in mind that every, everybody should be shouldering this problem. The entire city should be shouldering this problem and, and, and uh, entire districts. So. Um, I want to mention that this is a law enforcement issue because the lead officer on the west side of Venice has stated that she spends 80% of her time, she said this to me personally, that she says spends 80% of her time on 
on uh, camper and RV homeless issues. That's a tremendous amount. Now, they've also said that the percentage of problem campers is very low. But if those campers are in a, a working program, a program that's well designed and monitored, that's going to cut down tremendously on the, on the police workload that, you know. So I uh, just thought that was worth mentioning. The other thing is the campers do provide housing in a housing market where there isn't any. We've heard that, you know, 15,000 uh, people waiting for Section 8 housing. Um, and, you know, a bunch of foreclosed housing uh, sitting with locks on the doors. But, but the camper, if it's not the campers, what's the next step? Do we get them into housing or do they end up on the street or in somebody else's neighborhood? That's Thank it. You. Thanks. I appreciate your comments. Please. Uh, Booker Pearson, Upward Bound House, and the uh, Westchester Playa Neighborhood Council. Uh, I also uh, very heartily support uh, Council Member Rosendahl's efforts to uh, get the campers and people living in vehicles in, in secure and monitored lots. Uh, it's the best solution for a bad situation. Uh, I would ask that uh, there would be some um, provision. I noticed in the, in the recommendations from the other councils, there's no recommendation for segregated lots for families with children. And that has been the great success of Eugene and Santa Barbara. You do not want to, you, you want to have small lots with four or five vehicles with families with kids in one area. Uh, there are organizations like Upward Bound that would love to partner with the city to help monitor those lots to provide services on the spot, intensive case management, to move them out of the homeless situation as soon as possible. And that would be, in effect, a rapid rehousing uh, effort. Um, I also want to say that, again, back to the, uh, the de minimis type of uh, reporting that homeless families and children have is that uh, you will see very little or no uh, children or homeless, or, or homeless families in the, in the counts. But uh, in presenting to a couple of uh, clergy associations recently, the Westchester Clergy Association, out of 10, uh, 12 uh, clergy people there, all of them had one to two parishioners, uh, uh, congregants, families with children who were homeless. Uh, they all voiced support that they thought that they would, could get their faith-based organization to provide a small lot for families with children. So I think that this engenders community support. Uh, hopefully nobody dislikes children too much in this world, and I think it's a great way to start moving them off the streets and in, into a shelter and then to permanent housing in the end. And I, I want to uh, not only applaud you, but thank you for what you do with Upward Bound House. What's the status of the project that's in the heart of my district over there in Delray that is physically called Culver City, though it's in my community? What's happening with that 19 uh, unit? The construction project? is well underway. We will have a, uh, a grand ribbon cutting, uh, hopefully the first day of November, or first week of November. We, we're still... A re, uh, rehab construction is uh, always more problematic than, uh, than... So of the 19 units, two will be staff, 17 will be families? Uh, 18 will be families, and there's two uh, apartments for okay. continuous on-site management, and that's a, also a community room and a feeding room. And when will they be occupied? Uh, they will be cutting? occupied the day after we open. I mean, we, we, there's, we have a, a waiting list, uh, the hundreds and hundreds of families that are... Again, living in their cars, they're the hidden homeless. Uh, we see them. There, there are no other counts. I will say that we, uh, working with our friends at Lhasa, have they uh, graciously uh, partnered with us uh, to do a, a scattered site motel program before we could get the uh, the facility built, yeah. and that has been just a ringing success. I think, Mike, we have uh, we've blown the numbers off the door. We've blown the doors off the numbers. We we're up 100 to 50 percent of all our goals. Yeah, and, uh, I really appreciate that. And the project that we were just talking about, uh, the city of Santa Monica generously contributed, the city of Los Angeles mm -hmm. generously contributed, Xavier Oslowski and the county of Los Angeles did. Uh, any other cities? Beverly that, Hills kicked in 200,000. They did. They yes, threw they in a couple did. hundred. So there was a real collaborative effort it with is. Culver City in doing it, but it was under your leadership that made that happen. So thank and you so help. much. Thank that. you. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, do you want to do any comments at all? Um, Mike Arnold. 
um, or any of your staff, anybody here with you about what you've just heard? Any additional comments? Okay, um, I'm going to adjourn the meeting, and but then I want to informally speak. This meeting, Miss um, Perry, the chair of the committee, was here as we took the motion, and we passed it uh, uh, to the uh, transportation committee. Is there any public comment? Okay, with that, uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>